I noticed a couple of years back in the papers, I think the Times, I just saw a column saying that you, you had been trying to go abroad to a conference on peace issues and stopped at the airport and turned back. What was the history behind that? What, what? Yeah, this is the daily, daily reality. You know, right. Yesterday, one of our staff was coming uh, back from Europe to Palestine and they stopped him at the airport in, in, uh, in Zurich and uh, they didn't let him to, uh, you know, to go on the plane mm. uh, and so they postponed him to the next one mm. and they took his uh, equipment, cameras and, and so on from him. This is the Swiss, Swiss, Swiss police did that? Yeah. Uh, no, these are because this is a code sharing between Swiss Air and Al Al. Right. And so these were Al-Al security people right. uh, uh, who are based in Zurich, you know. But again, I mean, actually there should be no Israeli intelligence working on uh, on, Israel, on, on, on Austria, on, on Swiss uh, airports. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, uh, Israel is always allowed things which no one else in the world is allowed. You know? mm -hmm. so, this is part of being uh, God's chosen people. Mm -hmm. So the airport you were stopped at was in... It was here in Tel Aviv. In Tel Aviv, yeah. And then you just weren't allowed to get on the plane. Exactly. Yeah. And, and because you were going to talk about peace and theology. Yeah, like, you know, this, like this, uh, like this uh, you know, my colleague, he's very much engaged in, in dialogue and so on. I told him, you know, if you were not engaged in dialogue, you wouldn't go through this, mm. you know? Because Israel is interested to have the Palestinians being radicals. You, you, you're saying that they, they actually want a more radical person. Right. This is why I think they are happy with Hamas. Well, I, I mean, I read, I mean, uh, as a historian, that in the very beginning, Hamas was partly supportive of its growth. Right. Um, I mean, is this true, do you think? Oh, yeah. To, to, to split the PLO? Yeah. At that time, this was the case. Now, because uh, you know, uh, this will will just you know uh, give the Palestine the image as if it were another Afghanistan or something like a kind of terrorist state. Exactly, yeah. and so you don't need really to deal with the issues. You can continue your policies of expanding settlement and doing because you know there is no there is no. Uh, like um, peace uh, partner. No, there's no moderates, therefore the war is justified. Exactly. Whereas if, if, but that's that's scary, isn't it? From from a external observer's perspective, it's very scary to create, to demonise the Palestinian people in that way. Oh, definitely. I mean, uh, <coughs> but uh, well, you it's know, it's short-sighted, isn't it? It is. It's, it is. it's, it's ridiculous. It is, yeah. You know. But, uh, but the whole Israeli politics is short-sighted. They don't see beyond their nose, as we see in Arabic. You know. Is that because they've only been formed as, an, as a new state very recently, and the maturity of vision hasn't quite developed? Yeah. You know, these, these Israeli political parties are only a few decades old, aren't they? Uh, no, I, I, think, uh, 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 I think it has many reasons. First of all, I think they still did not come to terms with the fact that there, are, that there is another nation, people living in this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is part of the Zionist ideology. So I think that is... There was a denial right from the beginning. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now Oslo was supposed to change that. It did on papers, but not in the mindset. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I think uh, because of uh, the trauma of the Holocaust and so on, you know, I mean, studies shows like uh, if a woman is hit, you know, like by her husband, most probably uh, she might hit her kids. Mm. You know, there's um, a re recycling of pain exactly. between generations. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, the third, I think, which is, uh, I think there is a deep problem in Jewish thinking 
in splitting the world between Jews and everyone else. Uh, and this uh, feel of being cleaner, kosher, mm. and everyone else is not kosher. Mm. I think there is something which uh, Judaism uh, has not yet dealt with it. Mm -hmm. And this, you talked all about the chosen people, the notion of being the chosen people, that's connected with that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, if there was going to be meaningful theological dialogue for peace in this region, uh, talk to some other people about this, um, each separate narrative, each separate redemption narrative would have to listen to each other's story, wouldn't it? I mean, there's the first redemption, the chosen people, Moses, the promised land, you know, it's a miracle, it's magical. But then there's the Christian story, which, which in its own terms creates an alternative narrative, opening up the land to everybody who accepts God's grace, the miracle of love. Well, not, the, not the land, actually. Yeah. Okay. Because the land becomes a bit irrelevant. Right. Yeah. Well, the kingdom of God, then. Exactly, which, which is something totally different. Okay, so, okay. And it's, it's not connected with the ecology, then, in a sense. The, the place is irrelevant. That's why it can be in Scotland or, or Greece or... Right, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a more, it's a universal... Yeah, and I think, I think, because, because, I think because Jesus exactly understood what is the problem in Judaism. That if you keep, you know, thinking that it's, it's, it's just the land and it's just this one people, mm and they have monopoly. This is not what God was thinking. As Jew he was thinking. Yeah, he was a, I mean in my terminology, he was a Hellenistic Jew. He'd been exposed to more universal currents of thought, it seems. Yeah. On the more uh, liberal wing of Judaism. Um, interpreting the scriptures allegorically, mystically. Um, right. You know, actually, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about allegorically. Uh, I'm not sure that he did that. Uh, uh, I, I think well, he exactly understood where the problem is. Sure. Uh, I hear what you're saying, yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. And yet then, his solution, um, as I said, created a sort of uh, an alternative space for people right. yeah. to enter. But then Islam itself created a third narrative. Right. People who felt that the Christ narrative hadn't completed the work. And and, you know, Muhammad brought another redemption story. Right. The, the question is, how can those three coexist and find a common narrative? Is that possible? Ah, I mean, definitely it's possible. Uh, I don't see there any problem. Uh, you know, the thing is that uh, you might think that they are so different narratives, but they are so similar. If you go to Japan mm. and look from that perspective here, yeah. It's a family quarrel. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, mm. um, so I don't think there is any problem uh, uh, because he, within Judaism and within Islam and within Christianity there are narratives and not only one narrative. Sure. You know. So, uh, but uh, um, uh, yeah. I mean, one one of the as a philosopher. One of the challenges I see is how narratives can coexist, parallel narratives, in the same mind. In Japan, you mentioned Japan to take an example, the dominant majority was Shinto, which is the traditional religion of Japan. But they also, a lot of them have embraced Buddhism. And, and they coexist. The average Japanese thinker is both Shinto and Buddhist. Many of them now have Western ideas, Christian ideas, that, that they're parallel. You know. And so, alternative narratives can coexist in the same mind yeah. and, and don't result in a wall being built. Right. Surely the challenge for this, this place is, is for people to say, we need to share the land together, the, the water supply which is running out, working on energy sources, solar energy for the future, 
a road system that works, a railway system that works, employment and so on and so on. Our spiritual narratives are something different. We, we all inherit them together. We can coexist somehow. Yeah, but you know, I mean, uh, for me, uh, the problem is, is, uh, is not a religious problem. Right. Uh, the problem is, uh, it has to do with the geopolitics of this country. And thus, the geopolitics uh, uh, help uh, different identities to emerge uh, that are basically uh, uh, identities uh, supported by outside forces, influenced by outside forces. And, uh, uh, and for me, Exactly, this is where 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 Jesus uh, actually comes in, uh, trying to provide uh, you know a different understanding of a dynamic identity. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of our our work to to develop a truth and reconciliation process here, Israel and Palestine, what what degree of truth telling? is needed, would you say? What degree of listening in order for reconciliation to happen? Well, I think this is, I, mean, I think uh, truth is a basis because without it, uh, uh, you know, there is no, no way out. Now, I'm not sure uh, how ready people are to see the truth and to tell the truth. Uh, Truth-telling is something that's very painful. And so as I told you at the beginning, I feel that people are engaging in a big lie called peace talks <laughs> because they don't want to deal with the truth. Yeah. So the peace talking is actually just a way not to deal with the truth, you know? So what one needs really is truth talks first before the peace talks? Uh, I mean, not first, but, uh, but this is, yeah, for me, this is the basis, oh. you know, and... Uh, and is it happening? I mean, have you, have you been invited to Israel to talk to peace groups at all? Has anyone invited you to go and give the Palestinian perspective on the situation? Um, no, not in the like, recent years, no. Mm. Since the second intifada started? Yeah, yeah, even before, I would say. I mean, I was invited a few times, but, uh, you know, uh, Israeli are not very much interested to hear, I think, mm -hmm. the majority, to hear perspective from you know. They need Palestinians only if that suits the fundraising campaign of that institute, you know. Not, not the real story. Yeah, and the same with the first thing. It's not, you know. Oh. Uh, I don't think that is uh, because you know. In in, and this is why I stopped engaging in this dialogue. As I told you, because mm. in real life we don't need each other. You exist as separate communities. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, you know, they are not allowed to come here by oh. the Israelis. Oh. Most of our people are not allowed to go to the other side. And so what, to meet in Cyprus? I, I, mm. I, have, no, I, mean, I have no interest in meeting in Cyprus. No. Because if meeting is not something that is part and parcel of daily existence, mm. it's something that is uh, artificial and thus has no future. Mm. I was amazed in Jerusalem when we were in the, the new city, West Jerusalem on the bus and came round to the Damascus Gate and, and sort of east, northeast Jerusalem. The, the cultural shift, just a few hundred yards, quarter of a mile, and it's a different world. Exactly. And, and you would think these people do meet and mingle, but it was like a different, different, different space altogether. Exactly. exactly, exactly. And so, it, you know, Israel talks about unified Jerusalem, but Jerusalem is divided. I mean, everyone who has just uh, a bit of brain knows that, you know, it's divided. As you said, you know, you can see it. Mm. You know? But ideology comes in. 
to to deny the existence of the other people in that city, and thus to to work for an exclusive mm -hmm. uh, model of a Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. There's there's another narrative, isn't there? We've talked about the three narratives. The fourth narrative is that of science and technology of, of science, science and technology and secularism. It seems to me that Israel is 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 the super state in terms of science and technology. We visited the Weizmann Institute, where they have all these leading scientists. The, um, the military technology is obviously leagues ahead of anything that yeah. stone throwers can do. Yeah. And that narrative, the scientific technological narrative, brings its own raison d'etre of progress, development. Yeah. Um, I wondered if there's a Palestinian community of scientists and, and engineers and, and people developing the Palestinian technological infrastructure. I mean, I noticed there's a, a television station here, isn't there? Um, broadcasting. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I don't believe that, that Israel is like a, a super science state or something. Mm. Israel is a state by proxy, you know? Right. If the U.S would stop their aid to Israel. Everything in Israel would collapse. So it's artificial, actually. Right. It's true that uh, Israel is leading in the whole security and military uh, uh, industry. Uh, but again, uh, as a proxy. Uh, I don't think that without uh, the knowledge and without the equipment from the U.S., Israel can do anything. Um, and I think that actually uh, uh, history is uh, already bypassing Israel and Palestine on the margin mm. because we are too much uh, busy with, with our problems. Um, uh, and with occupation and so on, rather than focusing on the future. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I think actually, uh, Israel and Palestinians are, uh, if I might say so, very dumb. <laughs> uh, right. So I don't see any wisdom. I don't see any vision. Uh, so. But this is part of the truth, and no one would like to admit it. You know, they think mm -hmm. Israel think they are the the cream of the Middle East, and the Palestinians think they are the cream of the Arab world. Now, if you go to the Gulf states and you see what they are doing there, and we used to to call them camel riders, mm -hmm. you will understand actually where we are. So, mm -hmm. so I I don't think I think this is just this is. Uh, this is a myth which Israel was uh, selling to the world in the 60s, and the world believed it. But if you really look at the society, they are producing as many children, even if not more, as yeah. And those who are really good scientists on Israel and in Palestine. Most of the time, they don't want to stay here. They immigrate. They immigrate because they don't see that this country has the potential to give to them. Mm. So, what about higher education in Palestine? You, do you have links to Bethlehem University? Oh yeah, I mean, we have links to, to many. Uh, I mean, you know, statistically, we have majority of Palestinians are going to university. Mm. It's a very well educated society. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure how well educated. They all have like certificates, but uh, 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 I'm not sure about analytic thinking. I'm not sure about uh, uh, because for me, education has to do with with vision and has to do with know-how and has to do with with moving forward. Mm. If, if education doesn't help you to do that, then there is a big question mark. Sure. The other thing I was, I was picking up talking to people 
that struck me as very upsetting was to do with marriages across the cultures, across the divide. Am I right in thinking if an Israeli falls in love with a Palestinian and marries him or her, they lose their Israeli citizenship? Is that, is that true? Uh, I mean, they cannot live together, basically. Right. You know, unless they go to Cyprus or so, to the US. Or so there's a kind of wall between, between loves, if you want. Well, there is walls between everything, yeah. Mm. And, it, and that must, as a Christian, that must um, worry you, that, that love is sort of blocked and restricted in that way, even in that family sense. Uh. I mean, if love is part of the truth, you know, we talk about truth telling. Yeah. I, I mean, at the end of the day, but Christ, you know, Christ was talking about the truth is love, right. however we interpret it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't see it as you know, uh, very much connected to love. I see it very much connected to identity. You know, it's uh, um, because uh, uh, in a context like this, you develop a subculture, and uh, you feel very comfortable in that subculture. And it's very difficult to get out of this subculture mentality. And so I think this is the problem. Mm. Okay. So well, thank you so much. Yeah.